Today I would like us to think about the parable of the sower. The sower is scattering seed and some seed lands on the path, some on rocky ground, some among thorns and some on good soil. Unsurprisingly, it's the grains that land on the good soil that uh, will flourish. Incidentally, you might think that the sower can't have been paying too much attention to what he was doing, or he has some uh, subprime farmland. Without the explanation that Jesus goes on to give, the parable could go on to uh, serve as an analogy uh, for something else, say economic inequality, for example. By accident or birth, um, a person's life chances are determined by the environment uh, he or she is born into. But this isn't just, well, this isn't what Jesus is driving at. Instead, you might say he's talking about a kind of uh, spiritual inequality. And we know that economic well-being and spiritual well-being, if you like, are not necessarily coterminous. The modern West is sometimes held up as an example of somewhere that is materially wealthy, but increasingly spiritually poor. In this sense, you could say that the West is one of those places where the seed lands uh, among the weeds, among the thorns. It is choked by wealth and easy living. We're comfortable enough, thanks. We don't need God. We're fine on our own. This is, of course, a caricature and by no means the complete picture, particularly at a time of crisis as we're living through at the moment. But one question I would like us to think about when considering the parable of the sower is what is our role in all of this? Or in other words, what uh, can we do to help prepare good soil so that God's word can take root? Later on in Matthew's Gospel, right at the end, we find uh, the Great Commission, where the risen Lord sends out the first disciples uh, to make disciples of all nations. God reveals himself to us, but clearly uh, we do uh, some, play some role in preparing the soil. And why wouldn't we? After all, don't we want others to know there is a God who loves us? In the commission as recorded in Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. But before we think about what good soil might look like and how we might prepare for it, we have to recognise that whatever we do to help God's word take root, it is not done under our steam alone. God strengthens us and guides us in this task. If things had been normal and singing was allowed in church, we would have had choral even, even song last Sunday, and either me or Robert would have sung the Collect for Peace, that wonderful prayer that reminds us that all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works proceed from God. Now, one thing that immediately comes to my mind when considering the questions, what is our role in all of this and what can we do to help prepare good soil, is that people, different people come to faith in different ways. What might be good soil for one person may not be so good for another. And this is perhaps reflected in the diversity we can see within not just our broad Anglican church, but across the universal church worldwide. One traditional church might lead some people cold, while another uh, traditional church will move them deeply. So is providing good soil a matter of offering choice? It sounds rather consumerist, but you might think of it as part of the answer. Just as there are many ways into faith, there are different ways that lead from it also that we ought to have an understanding of, and we can be attentive to those places where the seed doesn't fall on good soil. There are many people who would say that they believe themselves to be spiritual. They believe there is something more to life that they can't get behind organised religion. And this might be for a variety of reasons. It might be because they have never really engaged or been engaged by the church. It's not really something that's on their radar. Or maybe it's uh, the church doesn't quite seem mysterious enough and you have to go somewhere a bit more exotic. 
um, if you want to find yourself in a journey of self-discovery. It might be nothing to do with organised religion per se, but with a distrust in institutions more generally. On the other hand, it might have everything to do with organised religion, and this will include those um, who have been particularly who have had particularly painful experiences of church involving discrimination or even abuse. And the church that engages with either of those two things clearly cannot be said to provide good soil. In fact, discrimination and abuse and their legacy have turned many from responding to God's call in their lives. And so on a more fundamental level, preparing good soil is not just about recognising there are different approaches to faith. It is a matter of living out God's love, because if the church is seen to have stopped doing that, if we stop living out God's love, it won't matter how transcendent our worship is, or the variety there is on offer, no one will come anyway. For all sorts of reasons, people have preconceptions about church, and one of the things we can do, one of the strongest forms of evangelism, if you like, is to challenge uh, those preconceptions whilst acknowledging and repenting of and making amends for past failings within the wider church. Liberal and inclusive are not two words that come to people's minds necessarily when they think of what a church is. We can we challenge uh, pre preconceptions here at St Andrew and St Mark when we describe ourselves as a liberal and inclusive church. And when we do welcome everyone, either in church or at the moment online, no matter who they are or where they've come from. So we do have a role to play in all of this. We can help to prepare the soil. Preparing good soil may involve some weeding, removing rocks, perhaps digging up the old path, getting rid of the stumbling blocks that prevent more people from recognising there is a God who loves them. Amen. <laughs>